Hello, and welcome to the webinar, A Reality Check on the Energy Transition. My name is Chris Robinson, Senior Director here at Lux, and I'll be moderating today's session. Presenting today are my colleagues, Chloe Herrera, an analyst, and Renil Dahlia, Principal Analyst here at Lux Research. Throughout the webinar, you can type any questions you have in the questions box on your screen. Time permitting, we'll answer all the questions that we can, but if your question does not get answered, please don't hesitate to email it to questions at luxresearchinc.com, and we'll make sure to respond. If at any point you have uh, technical difficulties, such as a frozen screen, simply just refresh your browser and check the internet connection is strong. So let's jump into the presentation. Over to you, Chloe and Neil. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Chris, and hello to everyone. It's, it's good to, uh, to be here to really talk about uh, the energy sector and particularly about the current progress that the EU is making on its uh, uh, ambition for the energy transition. But uh, before we look at the EU as a whole, I wanted to, to talk about this man. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this man is Mario Draghi. Mario Draghi, who is very well known to be the ex Prime Minister of Italy, but also the ex President of the European uh, Central Bank. Now, why am I talking about Mario Draghi? It's because very recently, uh, Mr. Draghi published uh, this report that looks at the future of European competitiveness. And upon publishing the report, this is what uh, Mario Draghi has uh, had to say, that Europe is currently uh, it faces a choice between exit, paralysis, and integration. Europe will have to make the choice whether it wants to exit the global stage, remain stagnant, or further integrate itself uh, uh, into global affairs. Now, the, the report was a very comprehensive report. It was two parts, and it looked at various areas of uh, the European uh, industrial economy. And of course, I will be going through the entire report uh, here uh, on this webinar. But what I wanted to show here is the reactions that the report has generated around uh, Europe. So you can see that the reactions were you know, some of them were thought that uh, uh, Draghi's analysis was impressive, but also out of reach. While some publications like Euronews or Euroactive, for example, were very against uh, some of the recommendations that Draghi had when it comes to uh, the future of Europe uh, as a competitive region. And one of the key recommendations that Draghi had was really around regulations. And Draghi believes that the EU tends to overregulate and that overregulation holds back progress. <clears throat> and this is the example that Draghi used to illustrate his point. Draghi uh, showed the EU's position on key digital technologies versus its biggest competitors in the world, which is China and the US. And as you can see here, in various areas of digital technologies, like Internet of Things, cybersecurity, and so on, the EU is uh, uh, lagging behind uh, China and the US when it comes to innovation and when it comes to technology. And according to Draghi, one of the key reasons why the EU is lagging behind is really because of regulatory barriers. Uh, Draghi believes that the EU tends to overregulate, and these regulations hold back the progress in emerging technologies. And that's the reason why the EU has essentially lost the race when it comes to digital transformation compared to China and to the US. Now, of course, uh, many people approve of Draghi's conclusion, also many people disapprove of Draghi's conclusion and the merit of deregulation. But I think there's one thing that everyone here can agree on is that the EU tends to overregulate. Uh, the EU loves to regulate in the digital sector, but they also do so in other areas, including the energy uh, sector. Uh, Chloe, do you want to tell us more around regulations when it comes to the energy sector in the, in the EU? Yeah, definitely. So starting in December 2019, the EU passed the Green Deal, which really set the framework for achieving net zero by 2050. And in order to support that policy, they published a whole host of other policies as well uh, in the subsequent years, uh, starting with um, the... Oh. Um, starting with the uh, hydrogen strategy and going all the way into the refuel EU aviation strategy. Um, and these really set 
uh, different benchmark benchmarks and strategies for achieving uh, net zero across various industries. And if you ask politicians what they think of these policies, they think it's great. Um, they think that this is the best way to achieve net zero. Um, and even President Ursula says that she's happy with the policies and thinks that, in fact, they're on track to overshoot their ambitions of 55% reduction by 2030. And so, of course, politicians have their own viewpoints of how um, their policy has affected the, um, the landscape. However, what does the data say? Um, if we look at the reduction since 1990 in greenhouse gas emissions in the EU, uh, it, it looks on track. Uh, there's about a 30% reduction. Um, but if we actually look at what that 55% reduction looks like, there's a very steep uh, slope here needed to get to that goal. Um, and then as we go to net zero, again, needing to reduce emissions quite significantly compared to where the EU is currently. And in order to get to that 55% reduction, it'll be relatively straightforward. Um, the primary uh, lever to pull for that reduction is really going to be greater deployment of renewables, solar and wind to decarbonize power generation. But as we move into uh, net zero goals, this is really where it's going to become difficult because this is going to require the deployment of really transformational technologies in more hard to decarbonize industries. Um, and so based on the, the data of reduction uh, that we've seen, there's not um, a lot of evidence that the EU is on track to meet its net zero target. However, um, that's not that's not all bad. Um, there's some technologies that we can utilize um, to reach these goals, and Renil will walk us through them. So when you look at uh, the various acts that the EU has published over the past uh, 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 over the past uh, couple of years, many of these acts has uh, they have targets for specific technologies in order for the EU to meet its net zero goal. And you can see some of these technologies here. <clears throat> now these technologies span the entire uh, value chain of the energy sector, from the production of low carbon energy to its utilization in the building, transportation, and the industrial uh, sector. So each of these technologies that you see here, each of them have a target for, the EU has a target for deployment by 2030 as well as by 2050. Now for the sake of this webinar here today, we won't have the time to go through each of these technologies. So we selected three technologies uh, that are key for the EU to meet its goals. And these are sustainable aviation fuel, uh, for the aviation sector, energy storage as well as uh, uh, green hydrogen for the industrial sector uh, mostly, but also for mobility and power generation. So taking a look at <clears throat> the first technology, which in this case here will be sustainable aviation fuel. Now, according to Refuel Aviation uh, Act, the EU has a target of blending around approximately 3.3 billion liters of SAF by uh, 2030. Now, that's a target by 2030, and you can see how far the EU is uh, from the target today. Today, in 2024, the EU has the maximum production capacity for around 300 million liters of SAF. Now, that's not even how much the EU is producing this year. This is the maximum production capacity. If every uh, biofuel refinery uh, uh, in the EU was geared to the self production, that's the amount that they could be producing. But today, the EU is producing even much lower than 300 million liters. So you can see that <clears throat> the EU is very far behind its, its own target for 2030. And given that uh, building new biofuel facilities, building new self uh, uh, production facilities will take a lot of time and billion dollars of in, and billion euros of investment, is very unlikely that the EU will meet its target by 2030. But what are some of the reasons why the EU is struggling to meet these targets? First, when it comes to policy, 
Refuel uh, Aviation, what it does is it poses a mandate on the EU to blend itself into fossil jet fuel, and that creates a market. What it doesn't do, however, it doesn't provide incentive to make SAF more competitive with fossil jet fuel. Because the reality today is that SAF is much more expensive than fossil jet fuel. And that's the reason why the market acceptance of SAF is quite low. Because SAF is more expensive, airlines do not want to adopt SAF because the result is that European airlines in particular will not be able to compete versus the global uh, peers when it comes to uh, uh, when it comes to offering uh, affordable uh, flights to its uh, passengers. But also technology is an issue because today SAF is commercial. It can be produced at the commercial stage and it is already doing, uh, being produced at commercial levels. But the technology being used to do that is known as HEFA, and that HEFA technology uses uh, bio oil, it uses uh, vegetable oil, and also waste oil uh, feedstock, which today is very constrained in terms of supply. So there simply is not enough uh, uh, waste oil in order to support the deployment of SAF technology at a much greater scale. So when it comes to uh, finding areas uh, to improve, it's really around these three. So how can the EU change uh, uh, the adoption curve of SAF in the next uh, five years? How can it incentivize adoption? One way is to, to take another look at its uh, policy. And what you see here is the difference between the EU and the US when it comes to policy making uh, uh, for SAF. <clears throat> now, the US they published the Inflation Reduction Act a couple of years ago. And according to the Act, the Act will provide a tax credit to self producers of up to 1.75 cents, uh, USD cents per gallon of self. If you take a look at the figure, you can see the difference that this makes here. Uh, producing self in the EU from waste oil will cost approximately uh, 80 euro cents per liter. And yet the price of fossil jet fuel today is at around 50 euro cents, which means that if an airline were to adopt SAF in the EU, they would have to pay an extra 30 cents. If you look at the US, in the US, it will also cost you around 80 cents per liter to produce the SAF. However, the tax credit from the IRA will shave off a good 40 uh, cents per liter, which means that in the US, even though it produce, it will cost you 80 cents to produce a liter of SAF, you can sell that SAF at 40 cents, which is less than the price of fossil jet fuel, because the tax credit take care, uh, takes care of the rest. So that's one way that the EU can uh, modify its policy to incentivize adoption is by deploying a similar type of uh, tax credit uh, in the EU. But the other challenge is also the feedstock. Because even if you were to produce affordable self, if your only feedstock option is waste oil, you will not be able to meet the target because the waste oil feedstock is heavy, uh, heavily limited which is why it's very important to unlock new technology pathway, pathways for SAF. And when it comes to the EU, biomass is key. The EU has a large supply of biomass that could be used to produce sustainable aviation fuel. There are various technologies, technology pathways, uh, including gasification of fissiotrope, pyrosis, but also alcohol to jet, if you were to convert biomass into these uh, celsic sugars. So when it comes to uh, <clears throat> Uh, meeting its target for sustainable aviation fuel. The EU has a lot of work to do when it comes to uh, 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 publishing new policy to incentivize adoption, but also when it comes to developing new technologies that unlock uh, biomass uh, feedstock. Now, the other technology we want to look at is energy storage. And for that, I will pass it back on to uh, Corey. And so when it comes to energy storage, this is really going to be key for um, that 55% uh, reduction by 2030, um, where we're deploying more wind, more solar. And the EU has set a goal for 2030 to deploy 200 gigawatts of storage and then a further 600 gigawatts by 2050. And if we look at the progress, the EU is not quite on track. Um, right now, they've deployed 20 gigawatts of storage, including pumped hydro. And this is important because pumped hydro, while, is a, while it's a great energy storage technology, um, the capacity for expansion is quite limited just due to geographical features. 
And so what this means is that Europe is really going to have to depend on other energy storage technologies like electrochemical, mechanical, potentially even thermal energy storage to further meet its 2030 goal. And if we look at some of the um, things that are keeping the adoption from accelerating in Europe, um, first is going to be policy support. While there is policy for setting goals for energy storage, um, and there is in, um, and there is some interest in building out energy storage, one of the major barriers is that there are not significant regulations to implement energy storage. So when a project builder wants to build uh, a storage asset, it's uncertain how they can get revenue from their asset and how that asset can participate in electricity markets. And there are certain suggestions from the European Commission on improving these regulations but implementation across all countries is going to be quite uneven due to the differences in, um, in the grid systems. Additionally, there's significant lack of incentive for build out of energy storage in contrast with deploying other renewable generating uh, technologies. So when looking at you know, deploying either a solar or wind project versus energy storage, it's unlikely that um, given the regulatory environment, a developer would be uh, incentivized to develop a, a solar or a storage project. Additionally, market acceptance is quite weak in energy storage, primarily due to the high technology costs. Um, so like I mentioned, there is this uncertain revenue potential linked closely to the, the lack of regulatory environment and reg regulatory structure. Um, but additionally, as the EU is looking to deploy different types of energy storage, the cost of these technologies are still quite high. Um, and that really dampens the, uh, adoption, the adoption of those technologies. However, the technology is there. The most energy storage technologies at, are at a very high technology readiness level. Um, most storage technology is mature enough to be deployed now to meet these uh, 2030 goals. So in order to look at, uh, or in order to implement energy storage, what really needs to improve is both the policy and the market acceptance. So in terms of increasing regulation to accept energy storage, what needs to happen is the, is Europe needs to look at other applications that energy storage can participate in. Um, right now, most energy storage is going to be used for shorter duration energy storage applications. So things like grid services and grid and peak shaving. Um, but as more renewables are incorporated on the grid, there's going to be a greater need for longer duration energy storage and larger system sizes for renewables integration and backup. Um, additionally, things like microgrids for resiliency or um, higher reliability for commercial and industrial applications are a key application for energy storage deployment. Um, once these applications are built into the regulatory structure, um, energy storage operators are going to have more incentive to deploy because they have more certainty in how their assets will get revenue. And then if we look at the technology costs, they're still quite high. Um, a, apart from pumped hydro, like I mentioned, which is you know one of the lowest cost large scale energy storage technologies, Lithium ion is really the only technology that can be deployed at scale for relatively low cost. Um, and so this is a, a plot depicting both the capital costs and levelized cost of storage for various energy storage technologies. Um, and what we see is that even in a, a four hour 100 megawatt system, most uh, technologies are not going to be hitting the the low enough cost 
to deploy um, at scale. Um, and most of these technologies are really going to be competing with lithium ion batteries. Um, and so once project developers have more certainty around how they're going to get their money back after deploying the energy storage, and once energy storage is a bit easier to deploy due to lower technology costs, the EU will then have uh, a bit more momentum around deploying this to meet their, their 2030 targets. And so we'll look at the next technology, which is low carbon hydrogen with Renew. Great. So uh, the EU has a target uh, for, for low carbon hydrogen, for green hydrogen. They actually have two targets. Uh, the first one is for the local production of hydrogen within the EU. And for that, the EU wants to have 10 million tons of hydrogen produced locally by 2030. But they also, the EU also has a target for the import of low carbon hydrogen, which is also 10 million tons by 2030. Now that's the goal for 2030, and yet today you can see that the EU is very, very far behind uh, that goal. Today the EU has the capacity to produce only up to 30, 000, uh, 37,000 tons of green hydrogen uh, in 2024, and they're not importing a single ton of hydrogen yet. So you can see that the EU is very, very far behind, and it's also very clear that the EU will not be able to meet its target uh, for 2030, given that there's only six years left, uh, in order about five years now, left uh, uh, for the EU to meet that target. So why is the EU very far behind when it comes to uh, uh, meeting that target? From a policy perspective, the EU is actually doing really well when it comes to uh, uh, incentivizing the adoption of hydrogen. The EU has a mandate to replace grey hydrogen with green hydrogen in the industry. They have subsidies, they have auctions for a green hydrogen. So they already have quite a strong policy landscape for the development of the local hydrogen economy. And from a technology perspective as well, uh, we have the technologies in order to build this hydrogen economy. And yes, electrolyzers are expensive uh, today and this is currently in development. But electrolyzers can be deployed at a commercial scale, and it has already uh, already happened in other countries of the, of the world. The challenge with hydrogen is really around market acceptance, because just because you can produce low carbon hydrogen does not mean that you should do so, because you still need to sell that hydrogen to a customer. And this is where today market acceptance for low carbon hydrogen is uh, quite uh, weak. The reason for that is because green hydrogen in particular is quite expensive, and the customers for green hydrogen, which is today uh, mostly the industrial sector, but also the marine and the aviation sector, are not yet willing to pay a very high price for that low carbon uh, hydrogen. So looking at the area that the EU really needs to focus on when it comes to developing this hydrogen economy, it really has to look at a mechanism to incentivize market acceptance. Now, what do I mean by that? <clears throat> if you look at where hydrogen can be used, uh, especially low carbon hydrogen, what you see here in the figure are all the different industries that are willing to adopt hydrogen. However, the willingness, uh, the, uh, the price that they're willing to pay varies depending on industry. If you look at the first four industries, this is ammonia, oil and gas, refining, steel, and chemical. <clears throat> These are the industries that will be using and that are already using, in some cases, hydrogen as a feedstock. Here, a molecule of ammonia, if you remove hydrogen from it, it's not ammonia anymore. So the ammonia sector, they need hydrogen in their operation. And same goes for refining and chemical. And in the steel sector, this is a future sector for hydrogen, where you use hydrogen to refine iron ore into iron. Whereas the bottom three sectors here, Heavy duty transportation, aviation, and marine, these are the sectors that will be using hydrogen for its energy value. They will be using hydrogen as a fuel. And you can see here that these sectors are not willing to pay a, a very high price for that low carbon hydrogen. And the reason for that is because these sectors have alternatives. They don't have to use low carbon hydrogen to decarbonize their operation. They can use batteries, for example. They can use uh, biofuels. So because of these competing technologies, they are not willing to pay a high price for that low carbon hydrogen. So really what the EU needs to do, and what it is also really doing to a certain extent, <clears throat> is really incentivize the adoption of hydrogen 
not across the entire energy sector, but rather focusing on the industrial sector, and especially the sectors that need hydrogen has a feedstock. Now, it's already, it has already done so with the mandate, for example, that 40%, around 40% of green hydrogen needs to be replaced with green hydrogen, but it can go even further to incentivize uh, adoption. On the other hand, it will be quite challenging uh, to build a hydrogen economy in the EU, because what you can see here on the figure on the right is the average cost of green hydrogen production uh, in the EU. And you can see that with the exception of Spain, it will cost quite a lot to produce green hydrogen in the EU. So most countries here, you're looking at a production cost of around eight euro per kilogram of hydrogen. Now remember that the EU has a target of 10 million tons of hydrogen by 2030. If hydrogen prices remain this high at around eight euro per, uh, per kilogram of hydrogen, then the EU will simply not meet uh, its target because if you do a comparison between the figures on the on the left and the right, you can see that there's no industry out there that is willing to pay more than eight euro per kilogram of hydrogen. And which is why when it comes to incentivizing adoption of hydrogen, the EU needs to produce hydrogen locally, yes, but rather than putting equal weight behind local production and import, the EU should actually incentivize uh, uh, the import of low carbon hydrogen from regions of the world where producing that green hydrogen will be much cheaper. And this is the Middle East, North Africa or South America, uh, for example. So there will absolutely be a hydrogen economy in Europe. However, there needs to be a refocus of efforts when it comes to deploying and incentivizing this, uh, uh, this hydrogen economy. So we looked at three technologies uh, that are essential for the EU to decarbonize. And we look at the progress that the EU has made when it comes to deploying these technologies according to their own uh, targets for 2030 and 2050. But remember, there, are more, there were more than three technologies, and you can see the other technologies here. Now, you can see that with the exception of heat pumps and wind, where, where the EU is doing quite well when it comes to meeting these targets, uh, in the other areas, the EU is lagging behind. Geothermal, net zero emission vehicles, wave and tidal, you can see that the EU is lagging quite far behind, is on target, and is very unlikely that it will be able to meet this target by 2030. Now, looking at this figure, it is quite discouraging because you may think that, well, if we're going to miss all of our targets by 2030, what's the point of even uh, uh, continuing? Now, that would be the wrong mindset because at the end of the day, decarbonization is, is needed. Uh, it's, 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 a legal, it's a legal mandate that was set by the EU Green Deal. Every country in the EU will have to decarbonize. So rather than being discouraged by, I would say, the lack of progress, what the EU needs to do is really, uh, 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 is really continue innovating and really try to make sure that they have the right measures in place in order to push the progress and accelerate that progress. And this is really the challenge that the EU will have, because <clears throat> remember, decarbonization is a goal of the EU, but of course the EU does not want to, uh, should not decarbonize if it means losing competition versus uh, the US and China, because again, the EU operates on a global stage. And that question that you see here, how can the EU remain competitive while hitting the zero emissions? This is one of the questions that was answered by the Draghi report that was published a few weeks ago. Now Draghi, in his analysis, came up with this conclusion as to why the EU has a competitive gap when it comes to clean tech. And there are various reasons here. For example, operating and building anything in the EU is quite expensive compared to China and the US. The EU needs to rely on critical minerals that it does not have. And there's also a lengthy and complex uh, complex uh, permitting uh, process in the EU. But one of the key conclusions uh, that Draghi mentioned is this one that I really want to highlight here, the gap spanning innovation and commercialization. Because according to Draghi, the EU is very good at innovating, but quite poor at bringing these emerging technologies to the market. And if you go back to what uh, I showed you earlier, if you look at the figure here, now clearly the EU has lost the race when it comes to digital innovation, when it comes to digital technologies compared to China and the US. 
But this wasn't always the case because if we had this figure 10, 20, 30 years ago, I'm very sure that the EU would be at pace with China and the US. What the EU really struggles with, though, is bringing these emerging technologies to the market, and this is why it has fallen behind. But this is a case for digital technologies. But if you look at energy technologies, you can see that the race has not yet been lost by the EU. Because if you look at the EU's position here in key technologies for net zero emissions, in the case of hydropower, geothermal, wind, and so on, you can see that the EU is, is ahead of China and the US. So the EU has a competitive edge. And this figure, which is from the Draghi report, is really a warning to the EU because the EU is ahead in clean tech, but that does not mean that it will always remain ahead. If you look at, for example, batteries, you can see that China has, is already catching up to the EU, has almost caught up to the EU, and will likely overtake the EU in the coming years, and is doing the same thing in the hydrogen uh, technologies as well. So really, the EU cannot lose its competitive edge. It has already lost its competitive edge when it comes to digital technologies, but decarbonization is an opportunity for the EU. It's an opportunity for the EU to remain a leader in on the global stage, especially compared to China and the US. Now the EU, all they can do is regulate, all they can do is publish policy in place to incentivize adoption. But when it comes to deploying these technologies, this is a responsibility of energy companies here in the EU. And for this, I will pass it back on to Kuleg. Right, and so while we've talked a lot about policy today and meeting those net zero goals, it really falls on energy companies in the EU to meet those goals. Um, and a lot of this comes down to innovating, not just technologies, but business models and making sure that there's enough momentum behind the adoption of these technologies to really meet these goals. Um, and so you in the audience, you're really the best positioned to make sure that the EU remains a leader in climate tech. Um, and you can really do so by focusing in on what needs to be done in the innovation space to further enable the adoption of those technologies to get to those net zero goals. And so what we really want you to take away from this um, is that first, the EU will miss nearly all of its net zero technology targets, um, not just for 2030, but likely 2050 as well. Um, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. That's nothing to get discouraged by because when um, building adoption of these different technologies, it'll really build uh, clean tech dominance in Europe. Um, there will be a lot of strategic um, incentive for adopting these clean technologies and becoming leaders in the clean tech space. Um, and so the EU is really at a great position right now as leading in this space. Um, and companies are really going to be tasked with not getting bogged down with the policy and making sure they reti retain that lead. Um, and the best way to retain that lead is to scale that technology. Um, of course, adoption in the EU is really important to meet those goals, um, but you can't do it if you don't have technology that you're, uh, that you're ready to deploy at uh, a massive scale. And so the EU is really good at developing technologies, um, putting things uh, from lab to pilot, uh, but the EU really needs to get uh, better at moving from that pilot stage to that commercial stage. Um, and that's companies like those in the audience that are really the best positioned to do so. All right, and well, thank you very much, Chloe and O'Neill. Uh, we'll now be taking questions that you might have in the presentation. As a reminder, you can drop those right in the questions box. If we don't get to them on this call, someone from Lux will be in touch after the webinar. Um, so the we have a few questions coming in. Um, the first one is about demand for power, which is, is something we're, we're getting asked quite a bit from, from our client base this year. Um, and the question is just simply, will new sources of demand for power, like data centers or you know, e-fuels, derail uh, meeting some of these targets in the future? 
So, so Chloe, I think that's I think probably that, a question best for you. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think that the increased demand for power is definitely cause of some concern, especially across uh, the utility space. Um, but the EU has put in a lot of investment in terms of energy efficiency programs uh, to reduce power demand. Um, and as these harder to decarbonize sectors kind of increase their own electrification demand, I think there's a lot of opportunity actually for energy companies as a whole to meet that. Um, so it's not always just going to be the utilities that are that need to step up and, and have that power delivered. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for on-site power generation, um, hydrogen, like Renil has mentioned, and, and other ways to deliver that energy like heat. Excellent. And then um, a question on technology that we showed briefly but didn't talk too much about today, uh, carbon capture. I think that was, of all those slices, maybe the, the smallest slice of, of progress so far. Um, so the question was simply, you know, what role do we think it will play in the future? And then what challenges does it face as well? Yeah, no, so um, carbon capture will be essential for the EU to decarbonize. That's, that's very clear. Uh, the challenge with carbon capture is really uh, the cost and the complexity of deploying carbon capture technology because the technology itself is commercial. It's been deployed at scale uh, in, in, in regions like the US, but also the, uh, the UAE, for example. So we can deploy carbon capture. The problem is that carbon capture will always be expensive unless you have carbon taxes in place to offset the cost of carbon capture. And today, <clears throat> uh, the taxes in the EU are way too low to incentivize the commercial adoption of carbon capture technology. But the other challenge of carbon capture is complexity because uh, let's say that you're a, you're a steel company and you want to deploy carbon capture, to carbon as an operation, you can very well build that carbon capture unit at your self facility. <clears throat> but building the unit is not enough because you also need to transport and sequester that CO2 underground. And a single company would not be able to build its own pipeline and dig its own sequestration site for that CO2. It's impossible for them to do that. And that's the challenge with carbon capture is that you, you can't do that as a single company. You really need to collaborate with other companies uh, out there. And here in Netherlands, for example, uh, there's a very good project called the Potos Project, which is a collaboration between various oil and gas and industrial gas companies in order to capture CO2 from various industrial units within the uh, Rotterdam area, and then build a single pipeline that will collect that CO2 uh, from different sources and sequester that CO2 in the North Sea. So this, this is the type of project that we need to see uh, uh, at increasing pace uh, in the EU in order to, incent, uh, in order to, to really uh, move the progress, the, the deployment of carbon capture technology in order to meet that target. All right, thank you, Renil. That is all the time we have for today. So thank you to both Chloe and Renil one more time. Uh, that concludes the webinar for today. The slide presentation and recording from the webinar will be sent to all attendees via email. After leaving the webinar, you'll be prompted to complete a survey on today's presentation. We do appreciate any feedback you might have. It helps inform and improve our future webinars. So take a moment. You can see here, uh, check out our upcoming webinars. And thank you one last time for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you.